We, I've gotten so much feedback the last couple of weeks. Actually, this, we've, I don't know, is this number four, I think, of our little one and done series? Um, we got a lot of feedback the last three weeks. People really are taking to this idea of looking at words in the Greek that aren't there again, hey, Pax, legomenons, these little words that are unique and for what reason. Um, and the feedback has been not just excited about the study for the nature of it, but the topics that we've covered so far, I think are, are speaking to people. What I'm trying to do when I approach this each week is I'm not really looking for, I'm not looking for a zinger, like, ooh, I got a, this one, people, we're getting this one wrong. Uh, and I'm also not looking for, for uh, anything specific. It's, it's genuinely just going through this list of words that, are, that appear once. Many of them are inconsequential. They're words that could have, they could have used something else they didn't. It doesn't mean that much different than the word they could have used. Um, but there are a few here and there that what I do during the week, it's just my process to let you know uh, why, because people want to know how, you, how we arrive on these. What I do is I, I look at three or four. I sit on them all week and wrestle them over. And I, equip, I have this to the equivalent of running flags up a flagpole. And whichever one flutters, you know, the spirit grabs that one. And if it flutters, I leave it up there and I let it flutter, and, and then I start to really dwell on it. And so these first few weeks have been words that um, sometimes they, they've been words that I only once in the last three weeks were, was it a word that when I started this series, I knew I was going to do. And a couple of the three were not that way. They were just words that I found during the week, and I wrestled over and thought, I, I can do something with that, and I want to. Um, I literally, if I don't feel it, just move on. And I'll put it in the background and maybe we'll pick it up later. I have a couple in my head that I'm going to do before this whole thing is over. And I leave them in reserve for that week where nothing else jumps. And so then we'll jump to those couple of words. But um, this week, the, this set of words, set of words, because we're doing two hapexes. We did that on our first week, but one we didn't do much with. And, but tonight we're going to do something with both of them because they both appear in the same story. And they don't appear anywhere else. They are two different words, um, but they are words that have a meaning for us in the English that is fine, and you can do a lot with it the way that we translate it. But you can do more when you look into the Greek and realize that there's more than meets the eye. Our title tonight is Distracted and Troubled. That says it all as regards to what these two words in the Greek are translated into in English the words distracted and troubled as they appear in the story that we're about to read. But when you see the words distracted and troubled, you, if I handed you a piece of paper and said, write down a definition of distracted, or at least an example, we'd all get pretty close to the same thing. And it would be something that takes us off point, something that pulls us away from our mission, um, something that causes us to lose our focus. That's distracted. Uh, and troubled is anxiety or a little bit of stress or I'm bothered. Bothered is a pretty good synonym. And these are fine, but they're not the Greek for what this word, these two words mean inside of this story. So tonight's an example of, of taking a couple of words that are okay on their own and they're okay on the face and the story doesn't, it does, isn't suffering because of our translation. But maybe with a look at what they mean in the Greek, the story takes a second layer. And so I'm never trying to ruin your, your, your interpretation, or I'm never trying to slant it or, or be like, oh, that, we should never see it that way again. Um, I don't see the Bible that way anyhow, because for me, the Bible has morphed over time. I, I see a scripture and then see it different and see it different and see it different. So all these do is give you another layer. It's peeling the onion a little bit and letting you see that there's more there. Let's read the story beginning in Luke chapter 10, and it's a story that's when you're in the Gospels, you're in stories that most Christians have heard time and time again. We've heard sermon after sermon on them. But I want to read it straight through. It's not very long, just a few verses. From Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through the end of the chapter, this is the story of Mary and Martha and that famous moment Jesus comes to their house. It happened as they went that he entered a certain village. This is the village of Bethany. We know this for later in the book. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. We're, we're, we're a chapter away from Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. So you, you are, um, we're, we're 
close chronologically is what I meant to say. We're close chronologically to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, but we're in the same house. Okay, so this is the home of Mary and Martha. Mary sits at Jesus' feet. Verse 40 tells us, Martha was distracted. There's our first word. Distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. 41. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried. And here's our second word, troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. That's the entire story. We don't get a lot of commentary. We don't get this story in another gospel with more depth. This is about as deep as it gets. And I, I want to just handle the practical stuff first, because this is sort of how we handle this story for the most part in the church. We look at this as a story that is about priorities. So some people's priority is to do and be active. And some people's priority is to sit at the feet of Jesus. And that Jesus complements the priority of sitting at his feet. And so this story becomes an example of how you should spend time with Jesus more than you spend time with everything else in your life. And that how it's very easy to get distracted and doing stuff to the point that you miss out on what you should do, which is set at the feet of Jesus. And this causes us to say, be more like Mary. So in a we, we use this as a comparison sermon or a lesson. We go, you have the opportunity in your life to be like Martha, which is busy, busy, busy. Or you have the opportunity to be like Mary, which is rest, rest, rest. Choose rest instead of busy. And we all nod our head and go, yeah, yeah, that's what we should do. <laughs> Let's go right back to our lives and go, perfect world. Jesus is at our house. I can tell you, if Jesus is at my house, I'm going to be Mary. I'm not going to be Martha. I'm going to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, that, and we sort of leave the story there. And it's got, you know, some good practical principles there called don't get distracted and don't stress out and spend some time with Jesus. But it also causes us to condemn the Marthas of the world, really. The people that are actually doing stuff versus the people that aren't doing anything usually end up getting a little bit condemned and made to feel bad because they're working so hard. And if we take this into a hyper-religious space, then all the religious people are Marthas and all the free grace people are Marys. You know, this is kind of how we can twist these stories pretty quickly. And so everybody active and doing stuff and working hard, you're a bunch of Marthas and you need to realize that it isn't about that and you need to calm down and sit at the feet of Jesus and be more like, and we usually mean be more like me. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what we usually mean when we compare. Be more like me, someone who's trying to spend some time alone with Jesus. Because, hey, even Jesus commends Mary. He doesn't commend Martha, he commends Mary. Hey, Mary chose the more needful thing, so be at my feet. And so then once again, we can leave that service or that class and say, well, I'm going to do everything I can this week to be a little bit more like Mary. Um, those are all of the, th that's not all, but those are the big ones. That's kind of the way we handle this story. It's used uh, to make us all feel like we need to slow down a little bit. It's used to make us feel like um, we need a life that's less distracting. And it's, it's made to com be, commend those who figure out how to sit at Jesus' feet. What does it look like? To set at Jesus' feet. That doesn't ever usually get answered. That, you know, we, we don't really come up with anything because Jesus isn't physically here. So what would it look like to live your life in a manner in which you actually sat at Jesus' feet instead of consumed with your life like Martha? But if you really got practical, how much would you get done if you didn't live a little bit like Martha once in a while? And Right? I mean, what would happen in the world if you just decided that you're just going to be the one that sits at the feet of Jesus all day long and this, nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to, no, that kitchen's not getting, no, none of the food's getting made. None of this, no one's getting served. This house isn't getting clean. Nothing's getting done because we're all going to be like Mary. And so this is why a lot of times practical preaching of our texts falls short. Because if you just get practical with the word and it's all just about principled living, the stories don't usually, they don't work. Like they kind of start to fall apart. And it's because they weren't ever meant to be told that way. And they weren't ever meant to be seen that way as just little tight, little principles for living by Jesus and by Luke the evangelist. There's more than meets the eye. And that's why, that's why the parables are always good. They're not just stories or the way I was taught, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. Um, they're more than that. They're, they're nuances and layers and things that they can mean and things that they, they shift 
to mean. So let's start with our first word. This is a hapax, a word that appears but once in the entirety of the New Testament and never appears again. And Luke uses it. Uh, it's Luke using it. Let me say it this right. Luke's the writer. Okay. So Luke's using all of them. Jesus doesn't speak Greek. We don't have any evidence that Jesus speaks Greek. So if I say Jesus said this word and he, he said it and no one else ever said it in the New Testament, I'm saying that wrong. Really, Luke has Jesus speaking Greek. Jesus isn't speaking Greek. Okay, Jesus is probably speaking Aramaic. Um, most likely. He, possibly Hebrew, but even in the world of that day, Hebrew people were speaking basically Aramaic, sort of the street language of the world. Luke's writing this decades after it happens. And he's writing in Greek because he's got an audience that's global. He doesn't want it confined to Israel, so he doesn't write it in Hebrew. And no one wrote in Aramaic for, for posterity's sake. They wrote in Greek because it was more widespread. And so Luke writes in Greek, so Luke's choosing the words. Okay, that doesn't mean I don't think they're not inspired by God. I've got a hapax on God breathed that we might do at some point. All scriptures breathed by God for inspiration. Okay, that's, there's, that's a hapax there. There's, that's a word that doesn't appear anywhere else. And we, we may dig into that before all this is said and done. But just because it's breathed by God, don't assume that it's God pushing the pen, that he grabs the pen of Luke and he moves it to say, you got to say it this way. It's going to come out of Luke as inspired by the Spirit. So they're choosing words, sometimes choosing words they haven't used anywhere else. And perhaps that's just because they have a, a rich vocabulary, but maybe because they're trying to convey something else. And then those definitions, because that word gets used five times, you know, only once, but it's, it's got derivatives. Sometimes our translators use the derivative and they could have used something else. So when Luke uses the word distracted, it's Luke choosing the word to tell the story. And the word he chooses to use is the Greek perispeo. Now, perispeo is a compound word, two Greek words jammed together. Peri, about, around, or because of, and spio is to draw. So, because of, around, about, around, because of, to draw. Literally, Martha is drawn about by her work. And I don't mean draw with a pencil, but drawn, taken. That's when something draws you in. You're drawn in of what you're doing. And so the word that Luke chooses to use to describe Martha's action is not used anywhere else. There's a depth to this word in the Greek that, that goes another layer, however. Maybe the next line. Too many things, if too many things draw you, Eventually, they drag you. I, I start here because this word, perispeo, in the, in the Greek, to be drawn, has a connotation of being forcefully drawn. So think of it in the terms of being dragged into something else. So if too many things in life, there are too many things, is how I really meant to say that. Too many things to draw you, eventually they begin to drag you. So if you have this and this and this and this and this, and you're kind of surrounded by stuff in your life that are all drawing you in. They're all demanding, we like to say it in our culture, they want a piece of me. Okay, they get a piece of my mind, they get a piece of my time, they get a piece of my money. All of those things are very real. If enough of them draw you, they begin to drag you. And Martha is dragged, that's the connotation of the Greek, she's dragged here and there, really, out of control. Now, we all want to receive of Jesus so much that we wonder if he, if he even cares in the midst of our stress, but we're drawn about by so many things. I'll, I'll work on that last paragraph in just a moment. Notice that Martha asks Jesus if he even cares. I'm going to get into that in a moment when we begin to work through the text, but so much going on in Martha. I don't know everything that Martha's doing. She's covered about with much serving. We'll get into that in a second. But there's so much going on that Luke chooses to use a word in which Martha's not merely, she could be over here, but she's 
a little bit off track because she's over here. He uses a much thicker word, a much more robust word. She's not simply something dangling in front of her that's got her attention. She's being pulled by all of the other things that demand her attention, that take her away from this spot of being with him. And we can be, we can be so much into what we're doing that we get so wrapped up in our stress because we're drawn about by so many things. I think this is more than just being distracted because that could denote something more attractive has temporarily grabbed our attention. So when we see the word distracted in the English here, we need to go to the next level. Martha isn't merely distracted. Martha is dragged. Let's see the text again. Luke chapter 10, verse 40. Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Much serving. I want to throw this in. This is not a hay pax. In other words, diaconia is a word that appears multiple times in the New Testament. But I, but I want to show you that it, it has a little bit deeper meaning than much serving. Much serving is the word diaconia. This is often translated ministry. So she's distracted by much ministry. And I think some of what draws us, some of what drags us is service or serving in ministry or doing the good, doing good things for God. But even all of this needs a pause in which we learn to rest with Jesus. I don't know that we've ever lived in a time more distracted um, not, not simply that there's things that can take our eye, but there's things that demand our time and they demand our attention and they, they, they drag us out of where we are. This, is a, this story in some ways is a metaphor for being dragged out of the place of rest, dragged out of our place of peace, so distracted by the stuff that's going on in life that it's, it's pulling at who we are into a place of destruction. And managing those distractions, people like me who are in active ministry, and so my whole life is in some way ministry, um, service, diaconia. It's easy to even let that pull to the point that it begins to drag and, and drags on you. Because anything, even something you love that draws enough begins to draw life out of you. You can only give so long in any situation until you're being asked to give more than you have. And, it, and if you continue to try to give in that situation, you're, you're giving from nothingness, which leads, not we love the word burnout, but really it, it leads to us pulling from an empty well. <laughs> we're, we're scraping trying to find something to give when there's nothing left to give. And what happens in ministry is that you can start to build your identity around your ability to give. And we live in a society that boasts about burning the candle at both ends, or he's not afraid to work, or boy, he knows how to stretch himself thin. And, uh, and it's easy to lean into the drag and the drawing. Don't justify it if it's ministry. Don't justify it because, well, I'm working for the church or I'm working for God or I'm doing for Him. Instead, check the drag in your life. Check the things you're doing to make sure that you're being led of the Spirit, drawn of His presence, and not dragged about with many things. And, and if it's not ministry, it could be a thousand other things. But we all have to take that inventory in our life to make sure that it's not just a mere distraction. Uh, or to make sure that it, it, at, at worst it's a mere distraction, but that it's not something pulling or sucking life out of us. You've, you've heard me say before, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and you might have more abundant, but the thief, and then he contrasts, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And all of those things are taking, taking, steal, kill, destroy. They're sucking the life out of you. Here's Jesus wanting to put his life into you. Here's whatever and whoever and everything the thief is taking life out of you. So if the life and the peace and the joy and the rest is being drained from you, then there has to come a time when you learn how to manage the distraction, manage the drag, 
and figure out what's the most important thing. So this is not, this principle of, well, Martha's out here working and doing wrong and Jesus doesn't want her to work. No, Jesus doesn't care at all that Martha's cooking. He's going to eat the meal. He's not offended that Martha's working around the house. The problem here is what is actually happening in Martha. It's not the action of working that's, that's troublesome. It's the fact that she's, it's, it's crushing who she is. So look at the next verse and watch Jesus' response. Jesus answers in verse 41 and says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. Troubled is our next, our second hapax tonight. Here's a word that doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament in this form. Thor Yubazo. And Thor Yubazo is a word that is built off of the root word meaning riot or uproar. So Luke has Jesus saying that his problem with Martha is not that she's distracted. His problem, he doesn't even use the word distracted. Luke used that. He uses a word for riot. So Jesus acknowledges that Martha's being dragged. The problem with being dragged is it's dragged Martha into a chaotic state. There's a riot going on in her heart now. There's a riot going on in her mind. There's chaos in her spirit. It's not the work that's the problem. It's that she's allowed herself to be dragged through it so much that it's caused a riot in her own soul. This is way deeper than she's distracted and she's troubled. This is, she's so drawn in by all the things she has to do that she's no longer at peace in doing any of them. And that they are becoming a mess. All of the stuff is just tangling up inside until what comes out of her is an explosion, an emotional outburst. She comes to Jesus and goes, don't you even care that my sister's not helping me? And Jesus acknowledges the fact that she's in a riot. She's in chaos. And he doesn't put his arm around her and go, it'll be okay. Because saying it'll be okay almost always sounds like the thing to say to someone who's going through it. But saying it'll be okay is not the same thing as it being okay. And saying it'll be okay is sometimes like saying to someone who's depressed, just get over it. You know, like, <laughs> why don't you just shake it off? Just... Just get over it. You go, this doesn't work this way. There's a lot of stuff being, there's been so much stuff dragged me that I'm now in chaos. There's an explosion that's happened inside. Everything has come together, crisscrossed. And the whole world now is gonna, needs, needs pressed out because it's all exploding inside. And so Jesus uses a word that's way bigger than just trouble. Okay, for instance, Remember John 14, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my father's house are many mansions. It's not the same Greek word. Because the Greek word that Jesus uses for troubled in John 14 is your mind is uneasy. It's, it's what it sounds like. I'm, I'm a little troubled. Boat's rocking a little bit. Things don't feel quite right. It's, a, it's almost compared to this troubled, it's gentle. It's like... It's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. That's the word Jesus uses when he says, don't let your heart be troubled. In other words, don't let your heart worry too much about what's about to happen. I'm going away to prepare a place, but I'm going to come again. I'm not going to leave you orphans. This is the cross to the resurrection, okay? He doesn't bother to say, don't let your heart go into a riot. It's not going to be time to go into a riot. It's not going to be time to go into chaos. The riot is a buildup. They don't just happen like that. There's a swell that happens in a riot. There's a lot of things go into it. And then there's an explosion. So Jesus is acknowledging two different kinds of troubled to his disciples in John 14. Don't get too uneasy about this. It's going to be okay. I'm going to build you a place. I'm going to come get you. There's, there's room in daddy's heart. In my father's house are many mansions. But to Martha... We're way past, hey, don't let this bother you. We're all the way down to there's an explosion happened in your soul, Martha. There's a riot going on. 
He doesn't condemn Martha for asking him if he cares. Martha goes, don't you care? He doesn't say, how dare you ask me if I care? I'm the son of God. Of course I care. He doesn't do that because he knows what's happening in Martha. There's an explosion in her. And whenever we get dragged, we take it out on the people we love. Martha takes it out on Mary. Martha takes it out on Jesus. We take it out on the people we love because they're the closest to us. And so we go after them first. We always hurt. What's the old song? We always hurt the ones we love, the ones we shouldn't hurt at all. It usually starts there. It's not the only people we hurt, but it's the ones we start with. And we ask the irrational. Don't you care? We ask Jesus if he cares. Of course Jesus cares. This is another example to me of why you should just pray to God whatever it is you're thinking. At least you owe that truth to God. It's whatever it is you're thinking. So just give God the truth. You can say to God, don't you care that I'm being dragged through the mud right here? Don't you care that my life is in a riot right now and it's chaotic? He's not going to condemn you for asking. He doesn't condemn Martha. He doesn't give her the answer we think he should. Oh, Martha, it's going to be okay and pat her on the back. Because it's going to be okay, again, is kind of like get over it. Like, mm, you'll get over it eventually. Instead, he does give her the formula. It's time to go look for the most needful thing in your life. There's a lot of things in your life that you need. But it is time to find the most needful thing in your life to isolate whatever it is that is the absolute most needful thing. So look at 42. This is Jesus speaking to close the chapter. One thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. I like this. Ancient texts read this as, Hey Martha, few things are necessary. I wish we'd have kept that. I don't know where along the way the Greek, we, that was our oldest Greek manuscript reads right here. Few things are necessary and Mary has chosen it. In other words, Martha, do inventory in your life and find out what isn't necessary. Because the truth is, is that a lot of what's dragging me down isn't necessary. Okay, there's some things I could let go of that maybe they're not necessary, or they're, maybe they're not necessary for me to pay so much attention to them. Learning to parse the difference is, is absolutely crucial. It, in fact, is our responsibility to determine what is necessary in the moment I want to get to that in a second. This story may exemplify modernity more than any other in the gospel. So let me, let me land on those two things. Um, it's our responsibility to determine what's necessary in the moment, meaning that sometimes you've got to cook the meal, and sometimes you've got to clean the kitchen, and sometimes you've got to prepare the house. But sometimes Jesus is in your living room. That's the difference. You know, sometimes it's a special moment. I don't think he's asking for me 24-7. But I do know that he's asking for me a little bit. I can hear it in my spirit. I, I don't believe that he's asking for me to have all day long prayer sessions with him. But I do hear his voice sometimes going, hey, I'm here. Let's talk. And that's, that's quiet time or contemplative prayer or meditation, or going through the Psalter and reading a psalm, trying to find one that sounds like where I am, or praying a prayer that the ancients have prayed for centuries, because somebody in a better spot than I am right now thought it through and prayed something that makes more sense than any of the stuff I'm garbling out. And sometimes garbling one out, just saying what I think and telling God how mad I am, that's just right too, because that's the moment that I need to be absolutely honest and tell him how confused I am. I'm not asking for that all day long, but he is asking for that. So it's up to me to take responsibility for my life and learn what I don't need to be dragged into. And that means that sometimes I have to say no to a request, or sometimes I have to turn my eyes from the things I'm feeding on, or that I'm reading, or that I'm watching, or that I'm listening to, or the people I'm with, or the stuff I got my hands involved in. I'm just using examples because the truth is, is that we're all being, and some, you can't stop some of it, but we take the responsibility for what's important when it's important and learning to lay aside. It's why, I think it's why Hebrews says, lay aside the weights and the sin that doth so easily beset you. Lay aside the weights because some things are just weights. 
And some things are sin. Some things are you just missing the mark. Lay them aside. Let your hands off of them. Let go of them. Don't possess them. Take responsibility for what's necessary in the moment. Not everything necessary in the moment is necessary forever. And then finally, this story may exemplify modernity. What I mean is that I don't know that we have a better story in the Gospels for our own lives than being dragged about by stuff. We've got technology and we've got, um, well, we've got technology more than we know what to do with. And we've got so much of it to entertain us and to occupy us and to take us. You know, because we've got to email and we've got to text and we've got to Zoom and then we've got to be entertained and then we've got to look at a spreadsheet and we've got to balance this and then we've got to go to this online statement and we've got these app we've got to visit. That's just the digital stuff. That's just the stuff here and hanging on the wall. And that's the stuff that is fairly new to this generation. And so there's a whole new world of getting dragged into stuff that's, that maybe wasn't there before. But there's, a, but there's been a lot of things across time and maybe no story talks about us more than this one because the more we're dragged the more frustrated and infuriated we become what's the antidote to that it's not just get over it and it's not oh it'll be okay it's choose the most necessary thing choose the most necessary thing in that moment it's not got to be the most necessary thing for every moment but choose the necessary thing for that moment and learn to place into its category what belongs in its category so that it stays in its space and it doesn't dominate you so that it doesn't get bigger than you so that it doesn't own your moment so that you choose the most necessary thing the good part and the good part is finding space to set at the feet of jesus and so i don't know what that looks like for every person but i know that it's impossible to sit there and be in the kitchen it's impossible to sit there and be distracted that's the point of the story so there are things we have to lay down to say, I need five minutes. I need 10 minutes. And if, if I'm speaking too much, that's okay, start with 60 seconds. Maybe you literally don't feel like you have five minutes. Your life is that packed. Okay, it's, it's time to start letting go of some stuff if five minutes is too much to find, but that's between you and the Lord. But find the space to take a deep breath and to spend some time with Him because as you sit at his feet. So more than any other spot in the Gospels, this maybe is us. It's, it's us being distracted, being dragged through the mud into all the stuff. We're going into a, we're in an election year, and here it comes in America. The onslaught, as if it hasn't already ha started, the onslaught of opinion and commentary and news. I put that in quotes because I think a lot of what we're hearing is news isn't news. And we're, just, we're being swamped with, what do you think of this? And we're forced to have an opinion and we've got to have an idea. And, and I don't know about you, but it doesn't take long deep into the year for me to feel like I've already been dragged through more than I want. Just go, there's a part of me that, didn't, that at some point just goes, I don't know if I even care. I, I, don't, know, I don't know if it's going to make that big of a difference, you know, which side we end up with. But I don't, I don't really feel that way because I, I don't want to go through life going nothing matters. You know, I don't want to go through life going, who cares? Because that's the lazy man's way out of issues is just to say, I don't care. You know, and then go about your business. Jesus doesn't say don't care. It's not about not caring and throwing everything down and burning the world down because you're mad. But it's learning where to put things into its proper place and then spend time with him. And so spending time with him can look unique to you and it should. And, and you... you there, there is, as far as I'm concerned, there's no substitute for prayer. There's no substitute for quiet time. There's no substitute for the Word. But at this season of my life, I believe this more than I ever have. There's no substitute for community. You weren't made to do this by yourself. You weren't created alone. You weren't saved alone. Your very forgiveness is couched within the concept of the other people that you know in the body of Christ. And so be with them. Because in that space, you are strengthened and you, you find hope and you find rest. And... This is the beauty of coming together because it should be a space where you drop the stuff and you, you let go of the drag that's pulling you in. And so if we need anything in this modern hour that, that's in the story of Jesus, it's these. So our apex is tonight. Perispeo, distracted, not just the trinkly thing that draws our attention away, but really drawn about. And a constant drawing about is a dragging 
the things that draw, 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 draw you in eventually become a drag on your life. You can only have so many of them. And so learn to limit them where you can and rest with Jesus. And our other one is Thoryubazo, troubled way more than just disease or unease or I'm bothered. That's a whole different word. This is deep. This is everything's on fire. This is close to all hell broke loose. This is Jesus saying to you, you are at the end of it. I want you to choose the most necessary thing. Start there. This isn't just you're bothered. This is you're burned. And so if you're burned, let's choose the most necessary thing going forward. Drop the other stuff that's not necessary. Inventory your life and start dropping the things that are unnecessary. This isn't going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be painful because dropping the things that are dragging you might mean severing some things that you put a lot of work into and a lot of effort into. And, and, and it might mean that for a season you've got to step away from that or that person or whatever. This is why we don't drag... Re- if you kept every relationship you ever had in your life with people, you would be dragging people. And some people would be dragging you because some people in your life, you went like this. And that doesn't mean they're wrong or you're wrong. It just means this was their road and this was your road. And you're not supposed to keep holding their hand because you're pulling your shoulder out of socket, trying to hold on to something that's going a different direction. And so sometimes it's people, sometimes it's relationships, jobs, thoughts, dreams, hopes, desires, stuff. This is how we inventory it. Um, The world would say, in fact, I think it was Oscar Wilde that said, let everything be done in moderation. That's not in the Bible, by the way. It sounds like a really good Pauline epistle. Somewhere in the Timothys, he said, hey, young Timothy, let all things be done in moderation. He did not. Um, But the Bible does get close to that, and you could say is superior, um, because it teaches temperance and self-control. Well, self-control, in some ways, is learning the art of what to let go of, where to feed yourself and where to not feed yourself. Feed... And, and I don't, I'm not talking food anymore, but where to keep yourself in that space. And so let's take those two words, realize they're deeper than meets the eye in the English. They say a little more in the Greek. But that's only for the, that's a vehicle. Hey, Pax Legomenon, one and done's a vehicle in this series. It's just a vehicle to say something more. Every week we say something more because we get to tell a story. We get to say, here's what this story might say to you. So Maybe what this says to you, to, to, to you in this room, to the viewer, to the listener, is that it's time to take inventory of your distractions, but not just the trinkets that distract you, but the, the things that are dragging you and figure out which ones to let go of. Let's bow our heads. And I want, I want you to do that too. Inventory your own life. This isn't about, I'm not, I'm not asking you to uncover the secret sin. I'm asking you to just take a look at your life of what drags you. And what you, what you might be holding on to that you don't have to hold on to anymore. And where is it keeping you from the most necessary thing? And if there's a, nece- if there's a moment where that necessary thing could be a, a time out with just you and the Father to where you bask in His love, then maybe it's time to take inventory and figure out where you can do that. Father, thank you that this message has become a part of my life. And I thank you that I'm learning, but I also thank you that I'm in awe of how little that I really understand this and how every time I get into this, I realize there are still things that I'm letting be a drag in my life that if I would learn to do what you told me to do, and that's to figure out the most necessary ones, then I could start to let go of some of this stuff. I'm asking, Father, for your help for your guidance, the spotlight of your spirit to show me the areas of my life in which I'm distracted so that I can end the chaos and the riot that happens when I have too many of them. It is not your will that I live my life in chaos and riotous. And so, Father, I pray the same for myself. I pray the same for those who watch and listen and who are here tonight, that you would reveal in us the areas in which we've been cumbered about. Maybe it's with much ministry. In my case, a lot of times it's much ministry. It's much serving. But that's not all. There's all kinds of things. And it's not just to identify them. It's not enough. I'm not asking you to just point them out. I'm asking you for the same word you gave to Martha. Because in your instruction is always your grace. The power to do it. 
And so help us to learn how to lay them down. Find and carve out space with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.